You know, one thing that I love about the content that I make here on YouTube is that the realm of cartoons is so versatile. Admittedly, I really enjoy to stay in the corner of 90s and early 2000s Nicktoons, but every once in a while, I enjoy to branch out and cover different cartoons. Cartoons were such a huge part of my childhood, and it brings me so much joy to walk down memory lane and rediscover all the old shows that I used to watch, and sometimes even stumble upon new shows that I didn't get the chance to see when I was younger. I've really enjoyed these last few years of diving into cartoons and sharing my opinions on them. It's been great. But over my years of watching cartoons when I was a kid, and even now making videos about these cartoons as an adult, I've noticed something. I've noticed that though every cartoon is vastly different from the next in its own way, there are always common tropes and storylines that we tend to see seemingly recycled and reused by different cartoons. More or less, you could look at it as a commonly used storyline template that you could copy and paste any characters from any show into, and it'll usually make sense one way or another. I remember noticing this as a kid, but I never really understood the reference when I was younger. But it all came back to me when I made that video about the morbid episode of Rugrats that ruined my childhood. I'll put a link to that video in the description just in case you missed it. It's an episode of Rugrats where Chucky wishes that he was never born, so his guardian angel shows up to show him what the world would be like if he had never existed. I remember seeing this episode when I was really, really young. Then, many years later, in 2004, I would see the episode of Fairly Odd Parents called It's a Wishful Life, where Timmy wishes that he was never born, and Jorgen von Strangel shows up to show him what the world is like if he had never existed. I remember thinking as a kid how interesting it is that those episodes more or less followed the same exact plot, and over the years I can recall seeing many different shows follow this same plot, such as American Dad, Teen Titans, The Powerpuff Girls, and honestly, there's so many more. This had me falling down the TV tropes rabbit hole, and I came to learn that this storyline trope is called It's a Wonderful Plot. Being based off of and named after the movie It's a Wonderful Life, which is the first movie to follow that style of plot. Basically, a usually supernatural force intervenes in a time of crisis to show the character facing said crisis a flash sideways of how different things would have been had one key part of the past happened differently. Most commonly, we see this transpire in the main character wishing they were never born. From there though, I fell further down the TV tropes rabbit hole, connecting the dots on all of the different TV tropes that I recall seeing over the years. There's quite a few that really stood out to me, and we're going to take some time to dive into one trope today that really fascinates me because I've seen it play out multiple times, and I've seen it go many different directions across multiple different shows and movies over the years. That's why today, on our nostalgic walk down memory lane, we're going to check out a few of my favorite episodes featuring the classic Freaky Friday Flip. If you're not familiar with the Freaky Friday Flip, it's where two or more characters swap bodies, or I guess minds if you want to look at it that way, usually by some form of magic. Typically, a deeper appreciation of the other's life is gained through the process. It's a trope that's named after the book and movie Freaky Friday about a body swap between a mother and her daughter. If you peek just a little bit deeper into the rabbit hole, the Freaky Friday flip is the most harmless sub-trope of the broader body snatcher trope, which encompasses a person's body being taken over by some sort of foreign intelligence. There are many shows that have covered the Freaky Friday flip, but today I've picked three different shows for us to check out, all of which have tackled the Freaky Friday flip before. The first one we're going to dive into is the season 1 episode of Danny Phantom called Splitting Images. In the beginning of this episode, we see Danny with his best friends, Sam and Tucker. Sam is preparing to give a speech at an assembly about frogs' rights, and how cruel it is that their school science program dissects frogs. She plans to offer an alternative to using real frogs. I can't believe it's not a frog cadaver. Please remove my detachable three-chambered heart! <gasps> Oh great, him again. I am the Bax Ghost, and I will have my corrugated cardboard vengeance! Sam and Tucker run off to the assembly, and the Box Ghost attacks Danny, actually posing a threat this time with a box of scalpels. He bumps Danny through many layers of the school walls. Tremble before the might of the Box Ghost, as you are devoured by... Uh, oh yeah. 
costumes and props from the Broadway classic, My Fair Lady! As Sam goes out on stage to talk to the students, she opens the curtain for her grand reveal and is met by laughter as everyone sees Danny dressed up as a girl from the My Fair Lady props. We then cut to later while the three friends are walking through the halls of the school. Thanks to your little dress up parade, my Save the Frogs presentation was a total bust. And speaking of bust, did you see Danny in that bra? Puce is not your color, pal. Yeah, and now because of that idiot box goes trashed my locker, I've been assigned a new one. Locker 724. <gasps> Guys, what's wrong? <laughs> you look like you've seen a ghost. <laughs> Before Tucker can tell Danny the legend of Locker 724, Dash Baxter, the bully, shows up to humiliate Danny. He throws Danny into his locker and walks off. Sam and Tucker let Danny out of the locker as Tucker says that Danny's locker is cursed. Just then, Danny decides to go ghost for some payback. I'll show you a curse. Cover me. Sam, it's about time you use that phantom advantage for some ghostly get back. Ugh. Bullies. Bullies. We fast forward to later at Danny's house, where he's walking into his house to find his parents up to their normal shenanigans. So, Danny, what's this I hear about you getting a new locker? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh no big deal, really. Uh, nothing for you and Mom to get obsessive about. Why? Is it haunted? Don't worry, son. You'll barely even notice us while we're sticking out that locker during normal school hours. What? No! Danny's at a very critical stage in the development of his peer groups. He's already considered a clumsy nerd. The last thing he needs is you two confirming it. Nice defense, Jazz. Total confidence builder. Danny's dad shows off his new ghost gloves that he plans to use to fight the ghost haunting Danny's locker, and after he's done causing some mayhem, we fast forward to the next day at school. Danny is seeing some kid near his locker being bullied, and this happens. Nice Shaco! Does it remove earwax too? Fascinated by AV equipment. Can you show me how it works? Later at lunch, we see all of the popular kids and the jocks at their table freaking out, sharing all the crazy things that have happened to them, just terrified that they're cursed. Nearby, Sam is feeling upset towards Danny, thinking that he's the one that's doing all this to the other kids. It wasn't me, I swear! Now that was me! Danny, I don't think you should be using your powers like... Lancer, I'll be right back. Don't listen to her, Danny. It's about time somebody struck a blow for Sydney Point Dexter. Sydney who Dexter? We get a flashback of Tucker explaining that in the 1950s, the locker that Danny now owns belonged to a kid named Sydney Point Dexter, who was the victim of more cruel pranks than anyone else in the history of Casper High School. Allegedly, picking on him was a graduation requirement. He got stuffed into his locker so many times that it's believed that his spirit still inhabits it to this day. Right as the story ends, Sam shows up with a box of frogs that she stole from the bio lab. Hey guys, what do you say we meet my new locker neighbor? Easy, Danny. Take it easy. You're right, Sam. I... Enjoy your sandwich, neighbor. That's it. Hmm, I wonder how Dash would feel if he had a frog in his throat. Or 12 in his pants. Oh no, you're not gonna exploit innocent amphibians for some juvenile revenge scheme. We cut over to Dash opening up his locker and then Danny shows up, box of frogs in tow. He gives Dash an atomic wedgie and pours the box of frogs down his pants. Then this happens. Hey, I'm free. <laughs> you think that's funny? 
Buster. Huh? What? You can see me? Yeah, that's right, bub. Now leave that poor kid alone. What? Oh, oh. <laughs> Man, do you ever have it backwards? Don't hand me that jazz, Clyde. You're the bully from where I'm standing. Uh, floating. Uh, okay. Poindexter decides he wants Danny to feel what it's like to be bullied, so he opens all the lockers and hurls everything at Danny. The whole school ends up being engulfed in the ghostly magic as people's lunches start attacking them and all the glass in the science lab breaks at once. Just then, Danny's parents and sister show up as she begs them not to go inside, but right as they show up, a group of kids sprints outside, so of course they run in, ready to fight the ghosts. Speaking of fighting ghosts, Danny and Poindexter are ensnared in ghostly battle nearby. Put an egg in your shoe and beat it, bully! I'm Sidney Poindexter, and wherever there is a single nerd in need, I shall be there. Hey, who are you calling a nerd? <laughs> That's the guy I used to have your locker! Poindexter and Danny continue to battle into the boiler room, and just then, Danny's ghost powers run out and he turns into a human again. Holy socks! You're the half -a. The what -a? The half -a. Everybody in the ghost zone talks about you! You're half a boy, half a ghost! The half -a. You have all our powers on the human plane! And, and you're using your powers for evil? No! Look, just listen, I, I took over Dash's body because... Hey, wait, you can take over a person's body? Cheapers, creepers, I would flip if I had your powers. I wonder... And just like that, Danny's spirit is sucked out of his body and sent right into Sidney Poindexter's awful little corner of the ghost zone, locked forever inside of Danny's locker. Meanwhile, Danny's parents are showing up looking for ghosts. As his parents are blatantly standing right there, Danny floats up through the ground and turns into a human as his friends try to hide him as best they can, not realizing that isn't really Danny. Meanwhile, in the ghost zone, Danny is confused as to why it looks like he's dropped into his grandfather's yearbook. We see Danny getting relentlessly bullied by everyone in the ghost zone equivalent of Casper High School. Danny tries to get out and he nearly falls to his uncertain demise. Meanwhile, Spiff diddly D man, so this is what it's like to have friends. You sure you're all right, Danny? Danny? Oh, me? Yeah, right. I'm right like I, Mike. Why does your voice sound so weird? Uh, puberty? What happened to Poindexter? Oh, that's where he flew the coop, permanent like. <laughs> We cut on over to Dash, who's having trouble with the vending machine, and Poindexter walks up and acts all buddy-buddy with Dash, using his ghost powers to make soda come out of the vending machine for everyone. His rationale being that Dash has probably lost his fair share of quarters to all the vicious bullies in this school, so it's time that someone's even the score. Meanwhile, back in the ghost zone, Danny's trying to find his way out, so he goes back to his locker and looks to the mirror for a possible portal back. Meister, we're short one for touch football. Are you in? Positively, absolutely. Positively. <laughs> when did you get a sense of humor? Poindexter notices the locker open, and he runs up to close it as quick as he can, sending Danny flying backwards into the ghost zone. While Poindexter's off having fun playing football with the jocks, Danny is still getting relentlessly bullied in the ghost zone. Danny gets an idea of how he can reach out to Tucker and Sam in the real world, and he uses his ghostly essence to travel through the real world and right in the grass in front of them. Well, it was nice knowing him. Think I could have his computer? Just then, Danny's parents show up again, and they run right through the message that Danny left in the ground, erasing it in the process. 
Whereas Tucker seems to notice that Danny isn't himself, Sam decides to use that to her advantage to push her Save the Frogs movement, considering that all the popular kids are fawning over Poindexter Danny and planning to have a party at his house tonight. As soon as Poindexter Danny takes interest in the button that Sam's trying to give to one of the cool kids, everyone takes interest in them. Sam doesn't have enough for everybody, so she runs to her locker, and this happens. <laughs> Poindexter? No, it's me, Danny! Poindexter took over my body and sent me into this bizarro spirit world! Prove it. In second grade, Tucker threw up in your lunchbox, but he told you Ricky Marsh did it. What? I kicked him off the monkey bars for that! It was you? <gasps> Danny? <laughs> the mirror acts as some kind of portal, but I can't phase through it. Uh, serves me right. Danny explains that he's only here because he was acting like a bully and now he's gonna get bullied for eternity. When Sam brings up the idea of luring Poindexter into the locker, Danny hatches a master plan. We cut to Sam who's running while holding Poindexter Danny's arm, saying that they need his help because there's a poor defenseless nerd getting shoved into a locker. When they get there, they find Tucker who uses the ghost grabber gloves to throw Poindexter into the locker. You've had your fun! Now I want my body and my life back! Yeah, forget you, bully! You're not going anywhere! Aha! <laughs> 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 I'm doing it! <laughs> <laughs> you may have my powers, but you sure don't know how to use them! Of course, I don't know how to use them, but at least I know how not to use them better than you do! Class gets out, and a whole group surrounds them, encouraging them to fight. The kids realize what they're seeing is Poindexter fighting the Haffa. Now, if you don't mind, I'm gonna live it up some more in your body! What? One false move, and I smash your door back to my world! You wouldn't! You'd strand us both here! Try me! I've got a better idea. I can make you. With your powers, I can make you do anything. <laughs> That's what I was hoping you'd do. With Danny back in his body, he flies right through the portal, and we see the group of bullies now impressed with how Poindexter stood up to the Haffa, invite him to go get an egg cream with them. Meanwhile, Danny crashes out of his locker and into Mr. Lancer, who's walking in the hall with a box full of frogs that end up getting free when he trips. Danny approaches his friends, and he admits that he abused his powers and that he made a mistake. The episode ends with Danny getting a new locker over by the band room, and all the cool kids think that he's a nerd for being near them. Hi, I'm Lyle. Wanna help me clean my spit valve? <sighs> my 15 minutes of popularity is up. And I wasn't even here for it! Yeah, but at least it wasn't a total loss. Looks like this baby's gonna get some use after all. Aha! I am no longer the box ghost! I am now the mechanical frog ghost! I changed my mind! I love this episode. There's so much I could say about this one. First things first, I gotta be upfront right out the gate. I really appreciate this adaptation of the Freaky Friday flip trope just for the simple fact that it has a Danny Phantom twist. I really, really enjoyed Danny Phantom when I was a kid. As someone who's always been a fan of all things spooky, this show was right up my alley. I also really enjoy the Butch Hartman animation style that's seen in this show and others such as Fairly Odd Parents. The premise of this trope leaves it a lot of wiggle room to be adapted into an interesting manner. In this one, I gotta admit, when I saw it as a kid, it stressed me out. Seeing Danny stuck in that ghost zone version of Casper High School with no way out really gave me anxiety as a child. Of course, like deep inside, you always know it'll work out in the end, as it always does in these cartoons, but still, it's a freaky idea to be stuck somewhere awful forever with no chance of escape ever. This episode actually got really dark in a few moments. First things first, just the entire existence of Poindexter is completely morbid. This kid is literally well documented as having endured the most harassment and abuse by his peers. It's a well known fact that this kid was bullied and they even said that you literally had to bully him to graduate. If you take that at face value, that's just disgustingly messed up. That's the school straight up giving everyone encouragement to bully this poor single kid. 
And as a matter of fact, punishing kids by not letting them graduate if they don't bully this kid. It's like the school endorsed him being a punching bag if you really take that statement literally. However, I'm sure that was just a hyperbole. Certainly, bullying him wasn't really a graduation requirement. I'm sure Tucker was just trying to make a point, but even then, if that's taken into consideration, the school has still failed massively by not stepping up and doing something to help Poindexter. It's like it was just widely accepted that this kid is going to be singled out and bullied and nobody's going to do anything about it. It's just shocking to me that no one stepped up to help or did anything to advocate for Poindexter or at least once protect him. He literally had no one there for him, and that's just dark and really sad. This episode also got really dark when Danny and Poindexter were fighting in the ghost zone and when Danny's still in Poindexter's body. He threatens to destroy the only portal that could get him out of the ghost zone or the school. Poindexter literally said that if he destroys that, then they would both be trapped there. Again, taken at face value, that's super dark. Both of these ghosts would have been trapped in that awful floating school forever. However, let's not forget that this is just a floating school in the ghost zone. Odds are, even if Danny did destroy the mirror, he would probably have been able to get his powers back by overpowering Poindexter and taking his body back, then he could just fly off into the ghost zone. Danny goes into the ghost zone all the time, and odds are he'd stumble upon a portal to the mortal realm at some point, right? Other than that, there are a few random things about this episode that I just gotta bring up. It's just disgusting how shallow the popular kids are at Danny's school. Like, the way that they just prey on anyone they perceive as below them is just awful. Even like when Danny does become popular and they start liking him, they still treat him like crap and plan to have a party that'll more than likely destroy Danny's house. I don't know, I just felt the need to bring it up. The way that they portrayed those popular kids in the series was just kind of icky. Moving on from there though, one weird thing that I wanted to bring up was the point where Poindexter has freshly taken over Danny's body and he goes up to Dash who's struggling with the soda vending machine. Poindexter uses Danny's ghost powers to get some free soda from the vending machine and Sam scolds him telling him that's stealing, but Poindexter responds saying that that poor kid's probably had more than his fair share of quarters stolen by the bullies in this school and it's about time that someone evened the score. Now, that right there makes absolutely no sense to me. How is stealing soda from a vending machine going to even out the wrongdoings done by certain students to other students? I just personally fail to see how that rights the wrongs at all. What did that vending machine company do to anyone? Why are they the ones that need to pay for certain students that decide to bully others? I just couldn't follow his logic on that whatsoever. On top of that, how ironic is it that all Poindexter wanted to do was stand up to bullies, but in the process he ended up enabling and encouraging a group of bullies? For a seemingly nerdy kid, Poindexter didn't seem to be all too smart with peace and love. The last thing I wanted to touch on in this episode, in an effort to end this segment on a light-hearted note, would be the box ghost. Personally, I love the box ghost. He's usually relatively harmless and tends to take over things related to boxes as per his name, but he's really just kind of a likable oaf in my opinion. He's honestly kind of funny the way he always refers to himself in the third person and just acts like he's so hauntingly scary when in all reality he's generally seen as unthreatening for the most part. However, in this episode, the box ghost went deadly. Dude came across a box full of scalpels for dissecting frogs and almost turned Danny into a biology experiment. It was kind of cool seeing the box ghost go badass for a little bit, not gonna lie. But all things considered, this was a great episode. I appreciated it and I'm just gonna give it a strong 9 out of 10. Next up, we're going to check out another show that we've talked about before that did a really interesting take on the Freaky Friday flip. That's going to be the season 1 episode of Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius, Trading Faces. This episode starts out with Jimmy outside of school with his friends Sheen and Carl as he shows off his new invention Then they can't even really understand a word that he's saying. What was that first part again, and that middle part? And, and that endy part, too. Well, well, simply put, it translates your thoughts and feelings into notes and rhythm. And so, without further ado, I now present the musical stylings of my brain. 
We fast forward to a dark and stormy night where Jimmy is mourning over what happened at school today. Meanwhile, Carl is standing nearby. Thanks for coming over to console me in my darkest hour. Well, actually, I was hoping you'd help me with my geometry homework. Now, the triangles are the pointy ones, right? Today was only the latest in a long line of humiliating pranks Cindy's pulled on me. If only I knew what she was thinking, I could catch her in the planning stage and... Whoa! Jimmy gets to work on his mission to modify this device into one that will let him hear what people are thinking. The ends of my fingers look like little pink plums. If I use headphones, Cindy will never know I'm reading her every thought. I wish I could try it tonight and see if she's got something sneaky planned for tomorrow. Nick! Uh, um, I, I hate to bother you at home, but uh, I'm stuck with these two dumb tickets for them. Uh, what was that band you liked again? Jimmy decides to call Cindy on the phone to see if he can get a read on what she's thinking, and to get a brainwave response, he has to have Goddard recalibrate his sensor a bit. Then he picks up her thinking that she hopes he doesn't know about the surprise they have planned for him tomorrow. Oh, uh, yeah, I just phoned to see if you had any special plans to humiliate me tomorrow. Oh no, don't tell me he's found out about the... If you can hear me, tell me the answers to 5A through 11C. I mean, just so I know that you're okay. Jimmy? Hello? I'm Cindy. Cindy realizes that she switched bodies with Jimmy and she freaks out. We fast forward to Jimmy and Cindy's body as he arrives at his lab and gets denied entry. Just then, Cindy, in Jimmy's body, walks up and confronts him. If you get garbage on my hair, I'll never forgive you! What have you got to say for yourself? Please don't put my hands on my hips. Guys, don't do that. I'll put my hands anywhere I want to put my hands. I'll skip to the doll shop swinging my hips like this. Swingy, 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 girly, 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 girly. Oh! Then fix this, you idiot. Now! Cindy says that school starts in 20 minutes and they don't have time to fix it because it'll ruin her perfect attendance record. The two of them go to school and decide to pretend to be each other for the day. Look at me, everybody! I sure am smart! Admire my big show off brain! You think I spent enough hours on my hair this morning? Hey, everybody! Look at my ankles! When will I get a pair of pants the right length? <laughs> Who knows? In class, we see Jimmy and Cindy's body talking to Libby, who's excited about the joke that they're about to play on Jimmy. Cindy, in Jimmy's body, takes a seat in Jimmy's desk and gets sprayed in the face by ink when she opens up the desk. Cindy takes this as a declaration of war and says some really dumb stuff to make Jimmy look stupid in front of everyone, so in retaliation, Jimmy stands up in Cindy's body and starts pit farting to embarrass her. Cindy, what happened last night? You said something about an extra concert ticket and then the line went dead. I wouldn't go to a concert with you if you were the last boy on earth! That's how stuck up I am. <gasps> Nick! I mean, Nick! She doesn't mean that! Quiet, children. Pop quiz! Cindy and Jimmy take the pop quiz and just absolutely fail it on purpose, choosing the most obscene answers that they possibly can. Ms. Fowl decides to sit them both down after class. I would like an explanation for these two disgraceful papers. There's a simple explanation, Miss Fowl. I, Jimmy Neutron, am a complete gabble-headed dipstick. Ah, but not as big a dipstick as you are, Miss Fowl. Uh -huh. And if I don't get a month's worth of detentions for that, uh -huh. you're even dumber than you. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Well, how many detentions is this worth, Miss Fowl Brett? We see Jimmy and Cindy in detention as Ms. Fowl sleeps and Jimmy works on his invention with hopes of reversing the body swap. Unfortunately, it's no easy process. And, uh, by the way, you start tomorrow at Hank's Weenie Barn. Here's your weenie. <laughs> it's something I've wanted to do all my life, Miss Fowl. Abraham, Mudface, Adler. 
Things just start to get out of hand as the two of them intentionally ruin each other's lives as bad as they possibly can. Cindy, as Jimmy, tells his parents that he wants more chores around the house, and that he wants a meat log for Christmas, and that he wants them to sell his bed, forcing him to sleep in the crawl space with the rats. Then we cut over to Cindy's house, where her mom is having all of Cindy's clothes packed away into moving trucks to be donated at Jimmy's request. Do we have to hide behind here? Well, sorry, Jim, but we don't want to be seen talking to a girl. Yeah, that's a mandatory five months of people pointing at you going, yeah, 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 without the possibility of parole. I've got to reverse this effect before... Do these shoes make me like... Oh, no! I'm starting to think like her. At least you're thinking. Ooh, conflict. Gotta go. Cindy tells Jimmy that they've spent all their time working against each other and that they need to work together to fix this situation. That gives Jimmy the idea to dump both of their minds into a virtual brain pod so that they can have their most trusted friends sort their memories between the two of them. Don't worry, Jimmy and Cindy. I'll put your minds back in the right places. You can't even keep the gravy inside your mashed potato volcano at lunch. You expect me to let you put my brain back? Cindy, don't worry. I know your brain, and I won't let them put any stupid boy stuff in it. Okay, listen up here. When our brains are uploaded, all our memories will appear on that screen. You three have to decide what belongs to who. Don't give Cindy my astounding ability to create and build pioneering technologies, okay? Carl throws the switch, and their brains are drained into a chamber between the two of them. We see Carl, Sheen, and Libby working to sort the memories on the screen one by one, ranging from Jimmy's entire memory of the third grade and the dislike of show-offy boys. Lots of time passes as the friends take turns sorting between the memories. Extreme dislike of girls who dislike boys who dislike girls who dislike show-offy boys who dislike- So confusing! Throw that one away! Download. The two of them wake up and they're seemingly back to normal in their own bodies and everyone celebrates a job well done. Cindy and Jimmy walk out and this happens. Did you um, notice when our brains were floating inside that thing together, which was disgusting, by the way, uh, one of us was imagining us walking down a country lane, holding hands and, um, kissing? Okay, I remember that. But it wasn't my brain thinking it. Well, it sure as heck wasn't mine. Yeah, it must have been yeah, yours, no, Miss you Vortex, just said you it was not it. mine. Man, this episode is one that I really look back on fondly. It's such a perfect episode of Jimmy Neutron, and I definitely hold this one in high regard. Much like how Danny Phantom did, this one adds its own flair to the traditional freaky Friday flip trope. I always love Jimmy Neutron because of the futuristic feel to the show, and all the cool inventions that Jimmy created over the years. This episode really did a great job of putting a very Jimmy Neutron twist on that regular trope. Looking back on it now, it's really crazy to me that the events of this episode occurred in the way that they did. Like, the odds of that very specific scenario happening were so low. Jimmy was calling Cindy at that exact time, using that exact device, when the lightning just so happened to strike in that exact spot. Like, the odds of getting struck by lightning are so incredibly low, but the odds of that specific phone pole getting struck by lightning at the exact time that Jimmy was calling Cindy and using that device was just so incredibly astronomically low. This right here is one of those scenarios that was really afforded the opportunity to go there with the comedy due to the fact that it was a pair of consistent enemies who were swapping bodies. There's a complicated history of hatred between Jimmy and Cindy that makes it interesting to see them go into this situation because each of them, I'd imagine, believe that they're finally getting an opportunity to get some well-deserved revenge against the other. The two of them go through some really serious hoops to destroy the other's life. Jimmy organizing to have all of Cindy's clothes donated was definitely a hefty undertaking. After all of the back and forth of them trying to ruin each other's lives, I found it interesting that Cindy of all people was the one to come to Jimmy and offer to work together to fix the problem. 
Of course, the best part of this episode, in my opinion, is the ending where they're sorting through the memories on the screen. I remember seeing this as a kid and thinking it was such a cool idea. I wondered what it would be like to have my mind dumped in there, and I wondered what kind of memories would pop up in there. It was really weird to me that though Jimmy and Cindy completely switched bodies, they didn't switch voices. It was like Jimmy's vocal cords were replaced with Cindy's, and Cindy's were replaced with Jimmy's. That was totally the case in the last episode we watched too, with Danny's and Poindexter's voices being swapped too, but that didn't seem as weird, but maybe that's because it was caused by ghostly magic and not by science, but who knows. Regardless, it was really weird hearing Cindy's voice come out of Jimmy's body and vice versa. It just felt really unnatural and was kind of unnerving, but all things considered though, I can say that this was a really good episode and I still enjoyed it as much as I did when I was a kid. The writers did a great job with their take on the Freaky Friday flip and I'm gonna have to give this one a solid 8 out of 10. It was overall a really great episode and I enjoyed it. The last episode we're gonna check out is a show that I really look back on fondly. It's a show that I remember watching a lot when I was like 4 to 6 years old and I was really into Cartoon Network. We're jumping into the season 3 episode of the Powerpuff Girls Criss Cross Crisis. This episode begins with the sunrise in the city of Townsville. The narrator sounds bored until he sees some crazy stuff going on at the professor's house. This big satellite tower starts emanating these crazy waves across the entire city and it makes buildings shake everywhere it passes. Once it's done, we hear the professor say, Oh, oh what have I done? Girls, girls wake up. Wake up, Buttercup. Professor, it's Saturday. Can't a girl get some sleep? <gasps> now remain calm, Buttercup. We see that the Professor and Buttercup have swapped bodies as a result of this ray. Blossom and Miss Bellum have swapped bodies as well. If Buttercup's in your body and I'm in Miss Bellum's body, then who is... Girls, girls, please! It's just bubbles! In the mayor's body. Ew! Good morning, Buttercup. Bubbles starts brushing her teeth and says good morning to the mayor when she sees him in the mirror. Then, when she comes to the realization that they've switched bodies, she passes out. The professor explains that he was trying to turn apples into oranges, and as he was messing with his device that uses the power of sleep waves, he overloaded it and ended up releasing a massive wave, causing them to switch bodies. Just then, the phone rings and the mayor in Bubbles' body calls in with Miss Bellum in Blossom's body to say that the whole town has switched bodies as a result of what happened. Someone took advantage of the confusion and robbed the bank, but they can't figure out who it was because no one can figure out who is who. Okay, we'll take care of it, but Professor, start working on a way to switch us all back. We can't stay this way forever. Agreed. Mayor, Bellum, I'll need your help. Change first. The three of them spring into action and arrive on scene at the bank to try to figure out who robbed it. They start asking around and an old lady chimes up saying that a big pink guy did it and that he was very angry and was concerned about his property, which leads the girls to go on a hunt for Fuzzy Lumpkins. They get to Fuzzy's house and they find out that he's swapped bodies with someone who has a British accent and is drinking tea. They get a call from the mayor again reporting a robbery at the jewelry store this time and yet again the same old lady is outside and tells them that it was a group of really sick looking green guys which leads the girls on a hunt for the gang green gang. Definitely wasn't the gang green gang. Then who committed these crimes? What about that monkey you're always chasing around? Yeah, my dad hates him. <laughs> Good idea. Milk and cookies. 
At this point, we learn that Mojo Jojo swapped bodies with a sweet little old lady, and we cut over to the same old lady that we've seen a few times now as she busts out of a store holding an expensive vase that she stole. The Powerpuff Girls show up and hit Mojo Jojo, and they shatter the priceless vase in the process. Mojo Jojo ends up fighting them as the old lady and absolutely crushes Buttercup in the professor's body. But when the other girls join in, Mojo doesn't stand a chance. <laughs> With the Powerpuff Girls all tied up and helpless, we cut over to the professor who's putting the final touches on his device to hopefully fix all the worldwide body swapping. He turns the device on at the last second right before Mojo Jojo hurts the girls and they all body swap again. Yet again, Mojo Jojo ends up getting the best of the girls and gets them in a defenseless position, then he finds himself hurling his sumo wrestler body at them at full speed. At the last second, the professor cycles his invention again, changing everyone's form yet again. With Mojo Jojo basically defeated, the professor cycles the invention a few more times and we see the group change forms over and over again. Finally, the professor ends up getting everyone back to normal, and the Powerpuff Girls end up putting Mojo Jojo behind bars. Looks like we put everybody back in their proper place. You said it, Professor! <laughs> 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 Now, this episode is one that I know I really enjoyed as a kid. I found it hilarious to see the professor's voice coming out of Buttercup's body. There was one really cool cameo in the beginning of this episode that's pretty easy to miss if you're not looking out for it, but at the movie theater in the beginning, the movie that's playing is called Freakin' Friday, a reference to Freaky Friday, the movie and book that this trope is named after. I also couldn't help but notice that we get a glimpse at Miss Sarah Bellum's address in this episode, and it's 69 Yodelinda Valley Lane. It feels kind of weird that her house number is 69, but hey, I guess we'll just go with it. One thing that really confused me about this episode is that most stories where people trade bodies, they end up in the place where the person they swap bodies was in when the swap happened. Like, for example, how when Cindy and Jimmy swapped in the last episode we watched, Cindy ended up in Jimmy's room and Jimmy ended up in Cindy's room. In this episode, that wasn't the case though. Everybody's body swapped and it's like either their bodies were teleported to where the other person's body was or their molecules rearranged to take the form of someone else, which honestly sounds like a painful process, so I doubt that one's going to be the case to be honest. It's just weird that literally the professor's body, Miss Bellum's body, and the mayor's body all woke up in the Powerpuff Girls' bed. Everything in that regard happened pretty much in the opposite of how usually we see these things happen, so I'm not sure what's up with that, but hey, at least they're doing it differently. Honestly, my favorite part of the Powerpuff Girls was always the villains. Mojo Jojo, Fuzzy Lumpkins, the Amoeba Boys, him, 
Honestly, this show just had the best villains. Sometimes it was almost as if they gave more character and originality to the villains than they did to the actual main characters, and I'd honestly say that it worked out pretty well for the most part. This show had some truly memorable and interesting villains. This episode was an interesting look at the villains though, because all of the villains that we saw weren't themselves but had someone else's voices coming out of their body. All in all, I can say that this was a great twist on the normal Freaky Friday flip trope, however I'm a little conflicted on it. I'm not gonna lie, I'm compelled to give this one a high score because of the sentimental reasons of it all. I remember seeing this episode when I was a little kid and honestly I enjoyed it watching it now when making this video, however I gotta keep it real, in comparison to the other two Freaky Friday flip episodes we watched together, this one just kind of was the weakest in my opinion. I'm not sure, it just felt really cut and dry. There wasn't really much mystery to what we need to do to fix the problem, it was just like give the professor an hour to tinker with his device and we'll be fine. There were some good hijinks and some good goofs and gaffs along the way, and I enjoyed the episode all things considered, but it definitely wasn't the best of the bunch. I'm gonna go ahead and give this one a 7 out of 10. It was good, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't perfect by any means. Now, the idea of common TV tropes is one that I find interesting and I'm excited to dive into more tropes in the future. There are so many more episodes that have done the Freaky Friday swap as well. I've got to give an honorable mention to the Fairly Odd Parents who've actually done some kind of similar variation of the Freaky Friday swap about seven different times now, but that's a story for another video. What do you think though? Is there any other Freaky Friday Flip episodes that you remember? And are there any other TV tropes that you want to see me talk about in a future video? Let me know in the comments down below. I always love seeing your guys' feedback. If you like this video, do me a huge solid and drop a like, and maybe share it with a friend. And as always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.